tempted to think that if the petrol engine was eliminated from the world tomorrow, that in a fortnight's time the world would grind to a halt, you'd be greatly mistaken. You may have to take the bus to work instead of your car or the train, but the bus will be working and the train will be working. And the power generators will be working and the pumps will be working. And of course, so would the huge container ship. And they'd all be powered by the same engine, one that's a close cousin of the petrol engine. Conceived in the Victorian age, it brought new levels of efficiency and reliability and made its inventor a household name across the globe, yet hardly anyone has ever heard of him. The very first glimmer of this extraordinary engineering concept can be found in a note he scribbled in the margin of his book when he was attending a lecture at the Munich College of Engineering way back in 1878. Study whether it isn't possible to achieve the isotherm in practice. Now that might sound like Michael Fish territory to you and me, but at that moment the diesel engine was conceived and he was only 19 years old at the time. Mind you, he was always a bit of a swat. Oh, and his name? Diesel. Rudolf Diesel. Rudolf was a driven man who throughout his life excelled at everything he did. The engine which bears his name was inspired by a demonstration he saw when he was 13 years old, an ancient device called the Malayan fire piston. Couldn't be simpler. Tube, piston, piston, tube. Just like that. The Malays discovered very early on in life that if you compress air in a tube, it produces an enormous amount of heat and ignites whatever's in the bottom. Now, old Rudolf Diesel saw this, and whereas you and I would see an interesting party trick, old Rudolf saw compression ignition. Watch this. That was the secret of the diesel engine. Simply inject fuel into compressed hot air and bang, the explosion powers the engine. No need for a spark plug, so it's much simpler and therefore more reliable than the petrol engine. Clever Rudolf knew he was onto something big. This is diesel's first practical working engine. You'll notice it's got a, it's got a cylinder like, a, like the barrel of a gun, like a huge cannon, which it had to be because it, it had to withstand enormous pressures to compress the mixture. And people had not built these engines before. They didn't know what to expect. The safety valves had a habit of flying off all over the place, unsurprisingly. But this one, they got it absolutely right. When people saw these babies running, they realized just what a fantastically economical and hardworking engine it was going to be. And it was enough to get him a world patent. And old Diesel absolutely cleaned up. It was an absolute total success first time out. Everybody in the world wanted one of these, not surprisingly, which is why Diesel became a frighteningly rich man very quickly. But, uh, you know, deserved to. I mean, he didn't invent the Smurfs, shall we say. Diesel wanted the cheapest fuel he could find. And since almost any inflammable material would ignite in the highly compressed air, he'd plenty of choice. He even used lamp oil and, heaven help us, coal dust. Ultimately, though, he chose a crude, unrefined, and hence cheap form of oil, a mixture that became known as diesel. Imagine if he'd been called Stutel Fünfenheimer. Anyway, the money began to roll in. He bought the most expensive plot of land in Munich and built an enormous house on it. 18 rooms, five bathrooms, and a cellar full of fine wines. Underneath the house, there's a whole warren, a network of corridors connected, simply so these children could bicycle around when the weather was bad. I wonder if something unpleasant happened to him on a bicycle when he was young. Who can say? Life wasn't always so good to him. He certainly didn't enjoy a happy childhood. As a nine-year-old, his father made him go to school one day with a placard around his neck saying, I am a liar. Although born in Germany, he spent his early years trailing after his parents while they failed to find their fortunes. First in Paris, where they were despised as Prussians, and then London, where things got so bad that Rudolf's father sent him back to Germany. He said he could no longer afford to keep him. 
young Rudolf found himself here in Augsburg in southern Germany. It's no exaggeration to say that had he gone anywhere else, he might never even have gone into engineering. So we're a bit like being sent to Rome and finding out you've got a, more than a passing interest in Christianity. Augsburg is the home of Maschinenfabrik Augsburg Nuremberg, or man as we know it these days. Something of a relief there. When Rudolf joined the factory as an apprentice, they were the engineering equivalent of Microsoft, i.e. a mixture of big business and innovation. And once the diesel engine was conceived, MAN backed it to the hilt. Now, what you have to remember is that diesel's revolutionary design was born at a time when most machines were driven by steam and coal was king. But the trouble with Johnny Curl is that it's inefficient. For example, for the production of steam, only one tenth of it is actually converted into motive power. It's 90% inefficient, in other words. So what, do I hear you sneer? So what? Steam's dead. The age of coal is finished. Well, you might imagine that thoroughly modern petroleum is significantly more efficient. Sadly, not so. Twenty percent power, eighty percent diddly squat. And this is the key to diesel's design. Efficiency. Ruthless efficiency. A theoretical efficiency of seventy-three percent. Cheers. Just as I suspected, unleaded. it. Doctor. hallowed halls of the Augsburg MAN Museum, your curator, Gerlinda, demonstrates why the early diesel had little chance of being fitted to a motorcycle. Once more. The diesel engine was rapidly becoming known as one of the cheapest to run and easiest to operate engine in the world. But it was an English company who decided to make it the most reliable engine in the world. And as almost anyone will tell you, they succeeded. The Lizard Lighthouse in Cornwall has been powered by diesel engines built by Lawrence Gardner and Sons of Manchester for 50 years. The Gardner diesel is a thing of rare beauty, an engine designed with meticulous attention to detail, and like all good engines, only truly appreciated when lying in bits on the floor. we got one. Didn't see that, did you? It's the Edinburgh socket set, they call that in Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> should have gone in for a trade, really. I should have got a proper you're job. You're wasted as this act. Oh, listen, you're sounding like my mother. That's right, keep it level when you're Yeah, I will, I will. Don't put your fingers on the No, no, I won't, one. I won't, I won't. Yeah. Here's your gas. Right, God bless you. Look at that, look at that. Waffer thin. How confident they are that their surfaces are flat. Look at that, that's fantastic. Right. Oh. Thank God, I'm not getting blackballed by the diesel club. <laughs> well, the theory, one of the theories why gardeners are so good is that each engine is assembled by one person. On the bus engines, they do 300,000 before an overall. 300,000 between mm. major rebounds. Then they get to somewhere like Pakistan. They've got no manifolds on, inlet or exhaust, no filters, no rocker covers, and they're chugging away, irrigating a field, you know, 24 hours a day, just chugging away in the Fantastic. dust. That was Diesel's idea, you know, to make an economic engine that would help countries that didn't have any major sort of engineering resources. We'll adjust the tablets in a minute. I'll do the fat finger job. Did you know that Gardner's made, they made half a dozen special engines in the 30s and put them in Lagondas, mm -hmm. which were kind of the very elegant sports car of their day, just to prove that they weren't big, coarse, ugly mm -hmm. motors. The Concours people have just loved it, of course. Seems so the diesel engine in here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice, sweet. 
You away now? Yeah, we're on. Give her a wally and then just push it forward. It may have been the most reliable engine in the world, the only problem was that it didn't move. Until the 1920s, diesel engines were not suitable for any moving vehicle. The problem was weight. Until a lightweight fuel injector could be developed, the diesel would always be a stationary engine. However, in 1923, the engineers at Mann finally cracked the problem and the automotive diesel was born. Of course, in, in 1923, the discovery of the automotive diesel around these parts was considered slightly less important as who came second in the frog swallowing contest. The United States really hadn't much time for the diesel engine in the 1920s. The country was riding the crest of an economic tidal wave, and Henry Ford was turning out petrol-driven machines at the rate of one every 10 seconds. It was a difficult market for diesel to get into. The USA was oil-rich and booming, so why would anyone bother with this newfangled diesel thingy when you could run a big petrol engine like this far more for sweeties? Well, unfortunately, the Depression was to change all that. The bottom fell out of all farm products, and when that happened, why, um, Farmers had to see, seek a better way of raising a crop without spending quite so much money. And so at that time, the farmers, the only way they could go was to do it with diesel power to save that extra money. It would save them 25 or 30% on what the gasoline and petrol was costing them. So only one company was good enough or had a good enough diesel that it could be introduced on the farms and see that gray yes, tractor. Indeed. That's the first one Caterpillar sold. I want you to meet my grandson. Yes, How's it going? I Good. heard you're kind of interested in these old tractors. Oh, I'm very interested in this one. This is the this is the one, isn't it? Is, is that a the... hint? You want to get on there and drive it? Well, I wasn't hinting at all. I wouldn't mind a wee well, shot, no, though, I'll I suppose. I'll be good with you. I'll Just let you drive it if you'll be Lovely. Ready. Randy then proceeded to hand crank a little two-cylinder petrol engine, which was then engaged onto the great big diesel to start it. Pollution City. Driving this beast, for beast it most surely is, represents the sort of self-indulgence that an international artiste of my caliber may expect. It's a privilege to drive the first ever diesel tractor sold in the USA. But not for too long. Even my natural padding failed to make the seat comfortable. It sure beat walking behind a team of horses, however. And since the fuel it used was less refined and almost half the price of petroleum, Caterpillar and diesel were onto a winner. By the end of the 1930s, half the farming in the States was being done by diesel. The diesel engine was just what America needed. It was a huge country and growing fast. That growth was fueled by the massive diesel trucks which crisscrossed the land, transporting everything from steel to coal to logs. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it only really has one fault, the diesel. Its power band is very, very narrow, which means that a truck like this is obliged to have 13 and sometimes 16 gears. But um, that doesn't really worry us because we have 16 gears. The 
attraction about the diesel is it has the most fantastic tractional power at low revs, which makes it absolutely ideal for pulling huge loads long distances. Take it away, boys. <laughs> With running costs at 50% and a power efficiency ratio of twice that of steam engines, the big new diesels revolutionized the old railway order. It was a sad day indeed, according to a couple of people I know. Mind you, they didn't think there were enough trains in train spotting. The diesel engine was king of road and rail. It was immensely powerful, and its efficiency was edging closer to Rudolf's aim. But even bigger and better things were yet to come for the diesel engine, especially bigger. The diesel engines being assembled here are truly awesome. These three-story monsters are called cathedrals, and it's not difficult to see why. Well, here you are. This is about as big as diesel engines get. It's a straight eight, two-stroke supercharged diesel. It produces about 24,000 horsepower. And we're just about to start it up. OK, chaps? Right. absolute state-of-the-art diesel technology. That engine is more than 50% efficient. That's three and a half times more efficient than any steam engine ever was. I think old Rudolf Diesel would be absolutely delighted. Down in the bowels of the container ship, the big diesel does its stuff. off to Rudolf, I say. When he came up with the idea for what he called his rational heat engine, I reckon he came up with a belter. Diesel's personal story ended tragically. He slipped off a ship at sea and drowned. And he just 
sent a very strange and confused postcard to his wife, which he'd addressed to a house they'd lived in 20 years previously. So there's not a lot of doubt that he really killed himself. Suffered from depression all his life. He was a classic great man brought low. A real tragedy. But then, look at he's left us. Good old Mr. Diesel. What a masterpiece. And you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you always hear this tune. Go on. Bingo. Here, in one of the remotest parts of Zimbabwe, the diesel engine efficiently generates all sorts of energy. Robbie will be back next Monday. And this week on The Big Picture, we look at the giant ocean liner's struggle to survive in the jet age. What does the future hold for the liners? Find out in the final spectacular episode, 9.30 Thursday. But stay with us tonight for The Uncertain Eye.